we, New Zealand, have some pretty sobering mental health statistics, you know, amongst other things, apparently the highest teenage suicide rate in, in the OECD. And so many of us in the room may well have our own personal or family or whānau experiences with mental health. And look, I had a period about 12 years ago where I was just run down. I went to my GP and I said, I think I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. And she said, your cholesterol's a bit high. Um, but then she started asking some questions that were a bit off the, the pure health questions. They were, they were kind of lifestyle questions. She said, oh, have you had any major changes at work lately? I said, oh, yes, I, I've, I've changed job. Oh, OK, have you any other changes in your life? Oh, I've, I've also, I've moved city recently. I've moved back to Auckland after some years abroad. She asked, any relationship changes? And you've got to understand, so I'm a pretty confident, sorted, together, professional type of person. So any, any relationship difference changes? Oh, well, I've just separated from my wife, um, but that's all sorted. Um, we're about to have our first child together, uh, but that's all sorted. We've got that figured out. And then she asked, do you remember, do you recall being happy any time in the last month? And I thought... What a weird question. What a stupid question that is. But this time I did not have a, a ready, confident reply for her. I actually had to stop and think. And I could not recall the emotional sensation of smiling in the last several weeks. And so that was my personal experience with, with, with mental health, I suppose. And so how do we get that feeling of fun, that, of, of happiness, back into people's lives in some cases? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? We prescribe video games. <laughs> Pockets of fun in your hand. And so there is hope um, in, in our mental health crisis. So cognitive behavioural therapy is a particular therapeutic approach which is well-tested um, and researched and can be digitised and has been in several projects in the past. And that's what the Habits Project that I'm involved with does. But on the other hand, there's also a bunch of research that says that shallow gamification is not effective. And so what Habits is, it's great. We've got two and a half years of user-centered, iterative design, collaborative researchers. Um, we've got the works in terms of UCD. Um, we're even going to plug it into electronic patient records once it is freely available as a e-therapy resource, so we'll be able to track the mental health outcomes for, these, uh, for our participants over multiple years and longitudinally find out if it really does make a difference. It's uh, led by the team at the Auckland University Medical School in the Department of um, Psychological Medicine, and we're targeting at younger teenagers, probably those who've just started secondary school. And so we're going to, well, and what we're doing is we're taking seven well-tested, proven, researched cognitive behavioural therapy exercises and teaching them to them. So the goals aren't information sharing or, or knowledge, it's actually rehearsing a skill so it can then be applied for behaviour change and, and used in their real life going forward. Um, so the goal is that sometime next year this will be available as a public um, e-therapy for people to use. The challenge is, because I want to avoid the shallow gamification, the challenge is in the 80s, we invented photocopiers and we made some fantastic forms. We distilled this face-to-face -face experience and the clinical body of knowledge into a five-step process. And in the 90s, we invented PowerPoint and we got really good at making three-step phases to explain what's going on inside your brain at a neurological level. Now, this is fine and appropriate when it's me face-to-face -face with my GP. That GP was working through a checklist of extra questions about what was going on in my life and had the resources to draw upon from her training to take it in different places. But when we digitise it, it looks like this. We end up designing a really linear step-by-step -step process. And so I'm talking about young teenagers here on their mobile phones. That's our target audience, right? So their expectations when they pick up one of these devices is that you can do with it. You can interact with it. This interactive system gives them two choices. They can go to the next step or they can quit. We've actually designed quitting into this process, into this system design. Compared to a video game or an interactive system 
which are empowering and engaging because they offer you choice, which gives you the sense of the ability, the opportunity to express your own autonomy, a feeling of having control, which is kind of important when we're talking about depression and mental health issues. That may actually be an experience that they're not feeling in other areas of their life. Or the opportunity to choose a path, see that there are consequences, learn from it, and react and readapt and do it differently, which is progress, mastering a system. Um, which again is a sensation we want them to, to experience. So what I found is we were given three-step processes and said, here, turn this into something deeply engaging. So we had to create and invent opportunities for progression and social mastery because you should not earn a medal for filling out a form. That is not a rewarding experience. So here's an example. One of the, the core tenets of cognitive behavioural therapy is that your feelings influence your thoughts and in turn influence your actions. And this happens inside a muscle, which is called your brain, and it is possible to train muscles and to alter this, this process. That's a pretty boring game. <laughs> so we expressed it like this. We had to add some complexity to that process or go back and understand the mental model behind the three-step process. So what we have here is an example of a visual of a brain. There are some thoughts and feelings that move through it, and you can direct them. You have the choice and the control to move them through helpful thinking. Or otherwise, they'll end up going through an area of the brain which is unhelpful thinking and lead to a flight or fight response. But what we had to do was create different types of feeling, different types of thoughts, different possible actions, and figure out how they interacted. And it turned out that that also supported a lot of the learning outcomes that we wanted to do. But it's still this concept, just represented in a different way. Here, I think, is the fundamental difference between game developers and usability uh, practitioners. The first instinctive reaction of a UX person is to reduce friction, to make it simple, to make it easy to, to interact with. Game developers, on the other time, we, we just love to mess with our players. <laughs> mess of our users. Ha <laughs> you think you're doing well. I'm now going to throw a boss fight at you. I'm going to throw some challenge at you. But it's a safe environment and you can fail safely in it and try again. Those of you who are familiar with um, a theory of flow may recognise that when you make things too simple over time, the, the bottom half of the quadrant, it leads to boredom. But on the other hand, it's also possible to dial up too far in the difficulty direction and create frustration, which also loses users. So the challenge was to find the right moments to add some complexity or difficulty to the app. And we could do that when users are highly motivated. Okay, maybe when I first signed up, I'm willing to fill out your boring ass personal detail sign up form. Um, or we do it when this extra interaction that we've invented and added on proves our point, um, helps support our message. So one of the CBT modules that we're, that we're doing is a daily gratitude diary. So this is an exercise that just makes you stop and consider the positive things in your life. And so we made it simple and frictionless and easy to use. And you could just tap on a tag and just say, yep, I'm happy for church and I'm grateful for sport. And ping, 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 it appears. Oh, and by the way, we reward you and your island grows and customizes um, and other nice gamification rewards like that. It was too easy. It was too fast. The users just breezed through it. They didn't stop and think about what was good for them in their life. So we added some friction. We made them type it in. So that's one of the things we had to do to make it just a little bit extra cognitive load, but to serve our educational purpose. One of the other activities is a relaxation um, app. It's a little bit like Calm um, app, if any of you have seen that. So once upon a time, Relaxation exercises were purely audio tracks. But then we added in that you had to drag your finger around the screen. And then we added in, and it unveils a picture. But what was also interesting is then we added in too much, and their, their vision was focusing on the peripheral vision, which conflicts with your focused attention, and they never saw that instruction. So we had to add it with audio or other ways. We also had to invent ways to give the illusion of freedom to navigate. Um, and particularly in this case, where it's an app they're going to use multiple times and visit multiple times, we could do that. So this is a structured problem-solving um, activity where previously you'd, you'd take teen drama 
and break it down into logical steps. And the, way, and the way this used to look is, right, you have three steps. Now consider the pros for step one. Now consider the cons for step two. All we did is just allow the user to navigate their way through that scheme, through that system. They can drag pros and cons onto any option, any time, in any way they want. Just the step-by-step -step process was an artifact of paper-based ways of doing things. So don't be afraid to give them some freedom. Let them make mistakes and correct them themselves. So notice I've just given a talk about gamification and have not mentioned points, badges, or leaderboards until the very final slide. They are extrinsic motivators. They're clear, they're tangible, they're great for onboarding, but they're often short-term in their results. What leads to the long-term loyalty or the deep engagement is the intrinsic motivations. Um, things like being able to feel like I have a sense of progression and mastery as I use this app, a sense of um, socially I get to express myself in this app, or it really is helping me do something that I love. And too often, the briefs that we get and the great design workshop work we do lead to really tight functional briefs. And my call to action for you today is to sometimes you've got to build something else on top of those functional briefs to add some humanity or playfulness into our apps. And that does lead to retention and enjoyment and fulfillment. Thanks.